freedom for ourselves and our family, the right to vote and equality under the law, all things we have come to expect on our road through life. But what if these fundamental human rights were denied us by a draconian regime? Would we have the courage to stand up and defend them, or would we look the other way? And what if it wasn't our freedoms being denied, but those of other people? Would we stand up and be counted, even if doing so risked torture, life in prison, and possibly even death? We really expected death sentences. And when you look at the gallows together, there's a bond can never be broken, only by death. Give me this bit of information, or are you going to hang? They said, no, our, our, our husbands were hanged this morning in Pretoria, and we wanted to, to know how we could get their bodies. In 1963, Nelson Mandela went on trial for his life for plotting to overthrow the apartheid regime in South Africa. When he finished and sat down, there was a long silence in the court. Because of the clear challenge to the judge, hang me if you dare. The trial would capture the attention of the world and alter the course of history. But Mandela did not act alone. The trial and the events surrounding it would involve acts of exceptional courage on the part of the other defendants, along with fearlessness and brilliance on the part of their lawyers. This is their story. Mandela! <laughs> is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid and I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often it could just as easily and perhaps much better be described as a policy of good neighborliness as a former High Court judge I believe the Rivonia trial is the most remarkable in legal history it was played out under the shadow of apartheid a unique experiment in racial oppression which denied non-white South Africans their political, economic, educational, and even sexual rights. Apartheid was brutally enforced, but a small group of men and women, black, white, and Indian, risked their lives to bring it to an end. One of them was Dennis Goldberg, who stood trial alongside Mandela in 1963 and was imprisoned for 22 years. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Robben Island Museum, a World Heritage Site, I'd like to welcome you to the island. Please proceed to the buses parked at the far end of the quay, where you'll be met by your tour guides. How did they catch you? You know, it was the informers. What do you call them? Informers? Informers, MPMP. MPMP. Ten floor. Yeah. Torturing, kicking. Yeah. Painting. Electrical shocks. Where they give you electric shocks? In my in my buttocks, in my testicle, in my chest. So I've never experienced. Oh, it's very terrible. Yes, that is very bad. It, it makes you to shit yourself. Yeah. And then they laugh it. They like it. Yeah. Yeah. And they put their feces in my mouth. Yeah. What? Yeah. They put my feces in my mouth to swallow it. You know. So, ah. Comrade. Yeah. But here you are. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here you are. I'm strong. <laughs> They're dying. I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> the scars remain forever. I still wake up sometimes appalled by what happened to me. And, and compared with him, my torture was light. I must admit, I come here. I do it. It's a duty, but it's very painful. Thank you. There you go. <coughs> no, I don't want to hold a key. I don't want to hold a key. Never in my life do I want to hold a prison key. I don't like locking up people. Did you have mats that you danced the floor clean? Yes, I remember. You danced yeah. here. The old blankets. Shikisha, you know, called Shikisha. Oh, Shikisha, yeah. Shikisha, yeah. yeah. Coming this way. That's right. And then the other group, you see, it was nice. Keep your body moving, yeah. Called Shikisha. Shikisha, Shikisha is, yeah. is jump, 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 jump. Because they used to dance, they used to dance while they were singing. 
And that's how we used to dance the floor shiny. <laughs> Crazy. There's no softness, there's no curtains, there's no carpets. And noise in one part of the prison reverberates through. Steel doors, steel grills slammed so that you feel like you're inside a steel drum and they're beating on it. I want you to do something for me. I want you to show that you can close the door quietly. But you can do it so that you slam it. And when it's being closed by the young guard, usually young guards, with the biggest possible noise, the biggest noise, I've locked you up, sort of sound. And then they would lock that, and then they'd slam the outside door, just to make sure you knew that you were locked up. And you're inside. Signs of separation are everywhere on public and private buildings. Africans must go to their own cinemas and not to Europeans. At this place, Africans must queue to get their passes. They must carry them everywhere. If the police stop an African and he has forgotten his book of passes, they put him into jail. Every African needs passes to work or live near a white town. He must have another one if he wants to travel. There are many different types of permits required, and some have to be renewed monthly. Once out of a reserve, the African lives in a sea of papers. Those papers make sure that the African stays in his place. I saw this extraordinary activity taking place where naked prisoners were dancing around using their hands to open their mouths, to splay their buttocks, and to shake the backs of their ears while a policeman went by with a police baton, tickling them in the ribs, making them dance to show that they weren't smuggling or bottling drugs of any description. I felt that I'd touched the heart of apartheid at that point with this grotesque indignity. The native, of course, is a man uh, is more of a child and has to be treated as such. The, um... When you say treated as such, what does that mean? Uh, well, he hasn't our standard of intelligence. And uh, when you uh, ask him to do a thing, or tell him to do a thing, you must be firm. Uh, you mustn't allow him laxit uh, any uh, laxity, because uh, if you play with him, he doesn't think you're serious, and then you lose control. As a child, I began to question why I could not go to the school of my friends. We played with white kids, we played with black kids, Indian kids. That wasn't more politics, it was just a pure human feeling. Coming home from school and saying to my parents my book called Our Country, it said South Africa is a democracy because all adults can vote for their representatives in parliament and even sit in parliament. And that means we're a democracy. And I said to my parents, why do they say all grown-ups can vote? Because black people can't vote. And they explained to me what was happening in the nature of apartheid. That year was the turning point in my life of understanding, of tearing aside the veil of lies around our society. We can say that the Bondu peoples are a flower and the Western peoples are a flower, each with a beauty of its own. And once you've gripped the veil aside, you can't put it back together again unless you lie to yourself every day. My mother took me to a film that was shown of the concentration camps. And when I saw the horrors of that, I was revolted. And I quite quickly drew uh, a parallel with some of the things happening in South Africa. And uh, that kind of set the course of my political life. I could see that apartheid, in the end, was a system of cheap labour. And cheap labour makes fat profits. And I believed the revolutionary transformation of South Africa was necessary. This was not just a fight for the rights of black people in South Africa. Whites would have to be set free. I wanted my children and grandchildren to pick their friends because they liked them, not because of their skin color. One man who it would seem had a vested interest in maintaining the status quo in South Africa was a brilliant lawyer from an elite Afrikaner nationalist family Bram Fischer. Bram was a very prominent Afrikaner. He was loved because he was part of this 
elite Afrikaner family. They had supported the uh, rebel Boers in the uprising against English-speaking British South Africa in 1914. Bram was a golden boy. He attended Grey College, the Eton of South Africa, in Bloemfontein, the heartland of Afrikaner nationalism. He shone academically and in sport, and at the age of 21, he was elected National Party Prime Minister at a student parliament. He was extraordinarily well known, and he appeared in a number of very famous cases who could easily have become the judge president or even higher office. But Fisher's life had taken a very different trajectory. Brahm led a double life with an apparent ease which, in retrospect, one finds very hard to believe. At the same time as being a pillar of the legal establishment, Fisher was also a committed and leading member of South Africa's outlawed Communist Party, eventually becoming acting chairman, the only leader of a revolutionary Communist Party ever to have played scrum half against the All Blacks. His communism, frankly, has a great deal of Christianity in it. It's about self-sacrifice in the interests of the poor. I think he was motivated by love, not by power. What drew Fisher to communism was the fact that when he joined the party, it was the only one open to all races and advocating votes for all. The road to Damascus moment for Brahm was being uncomfortable to shake hands with a black man, although he had grown up with black children, and, you know, he started thinking about it. He shook this man's hand, and he was actually quite repulsed at some level. And then he went back home that night, and he couldn't sleep. He would actually, just on his own, in that kind of sleepless night, come to say, this is crazy. Fisher's convictions were shared by his wife, Molly. Highly supportive, very much uh, a colleague. If Molly saw people fighting, if she saw a white man and a black man fighting, she would go and get involved. And obviously the black man was in the right and the white man was not. Brahm and Molly's Johannesburg home was an oasis of humanity in a desert of bigotry where they lived with their own children and their unofficially adopted black daughter, Nora. The Fisher household was a scene of enormous entertainment. I mean, it was a huge mixture of people. You're never sure who was going to pitch up. It could be very senior members of the ANC. Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu. One of the things which struck me very forcibly when I started uh, becoming uh, a habitué of Beaumont Street was the fact that it was multiracial. And not in any uh, precious and observed way. It, it, it seemed totally natural. The Fisher House had already a swimming pool. And there were no swimming pools for people who were not white anyway. To this day, I meet people who say, oh, I learned to swim in your pool. <laughs> it was a window on what South Africa could become. Formed in 1912, the African National Congress's stated aim was to defend the rights of all Africans. It was committed to using nonviolent means, but by 1960, this was proving ineffective. Every peaceful protest was met with armed force. So there was not much possibility at that time for mass political protests. Demonstrations against the South African government's strict apartheid policies flare into shocking violence. At Sharpsville, an industrial township, thousands gather outside a police station in protest against new laws requiring every African to carry a pass at all times. The crowd refused to disperse and began stoning the police who opened fire into the crowd from behind a wire fence. The Sharpville massacre in 1960, in which 69 unarmed Africans were shot dead by police, many in the back, and the subsequent banning of the ANC led to a change in tactics from the group's charismatic 43-year-old leader. 
There are many people who feel that it is useless and futile for us to continue talking peace and non-violence against a government whose reply is only savage attacks on an unarmed and defenseless people. And I think the time has come for us to consider, in the light of our experiences in this day at home, whether the methods which we have applied so far are adequate. My understanding was that it was armed resistance, or some people call it armed propaganda. In other words, when the police came and attacked a township, there should be some resistance to this, and people needed to be trained and armed. The first phase was recruiting and training people, uh, recruits in the manufacture and planting of bombs. Of course, uh, care had to be taken that when bombs are planted, there will be no injury to human beings. At the beginning, we were told the NEC was against it. But you know, Madiba was a very, very persuasive person. Ultimately, the NEC was convinced and they said, Mandela, you can go on with this thing of yours. Mandela went underground and his new armed wing, Umkonte Wisizwe, the Spear of the Nation, or MK, began its campaign in 1961, carrying out 200 acts of sabotage in 18 months. I became technical officer in Umkonte Wisizwe's regional command in the Western Cape, and in fact organized the first training camp inside South Africa. And these young people were so enthusiastic. I was one of the first people to, to go for military training so that we could come back and meet the enemy with uh, weapons, as they were killing us with weapons also. We were going to transform the world. It really was exciting. But the leader of MK, the so-called Black Pimpernel, was already a marked man. Mandela did have a sense of bravado. Some people have said, oh, he was courting arrest. I don't believe that. But I think he had a, a sense of who dares wins. The notion that he had to show the people that there was resistance to apartheid. And it was, he was the first of a new breed of professional revolutionaries. In August 1962, Mandela's luck ran out. He was arrested on charges of inciting strikes and leaving the country without a passport. I went into the room in which he was being held and there he was in traditional African dress and I was quite shocked. And he said to me, when he brought these for me, I want to show uh, that I'm proud of my people and proud of the history and that I'm a black man in a white man's court. And then we went into court and he made this speech attacking the magistrate, saying he wouldn't recognise the court, asking the magistrate to recuse himself. And I then realised what he was doing. And it, it, he, it was a very clever move on his part. If by imprisoning Mandela, the authorities had hoped to decapitate the anti-apartheid movement, they had seriously underestimated their opponent's courage and ingenuity. Now, there was a document called Operation Mayabuya, which was uh, drawn up by people who were living on a different planet. <laughs> <laughs> We were given copies of Operation Mayabuya to read and make corrections. The plan, as explained to me at that point, envisaged having guerrilla commanders all over the country. Then there would be some kind of invasion by foreigners, troops who would link up. And I, I just thought, this is just a dream world. We were fresh and we wanted to get into action. So the document to us was all right. Whatever the wisdom or otherwise of this blueprint for guerrilla warfare, it required further discussion by the ANC and MK High Command. When we came to discuss where should we meet, we all knew that uh, Lily's Leaf was no longer safe because several people who knew the place were under solitary confinement, interrogation, one or more of them might break at any moment. Lily's Leaf had been procured as a safe house for clandestine meetings of the Communist Party leadership by Bram Fischer. And we eventually all agreed, well, one last time, we'll come here uh, on Thursday afternoon. 
So it was the classic mistake. Amongst those attending the Lilies Leaf meeting was Lionel Rusty Bernstein, a communist architect who had helped draft the resistance movement's manifesto, the Freedom Charter. Bernstein wanted to renew his objections uh, to the plan before we'd even started discussing it. Uh, the geese started cackling, it's not like rather like ancient Rome, the geese give the game away. Then we saw this vehicle coming in. At first we ignored it, because the vehicle used to come regularly to the Gorai house. Bernstein said, my God, I saw that van outside the police station. I came past the police station. So we realized there was something on. The back doors opened and the police jumped out. But they first went to the main house where they got Dennis. Grabbed my jacket, grabbed my notebook, running for the toilet to get rid of my notes. But grenade casings and landmine casings and explosive components and so on. And damn, the cops waiting for me at the toilet and I'm taken with my notebook. Back in the thatched cottage, those watching in horror as events unfolded included ANC leaders Walter Sisulu, Govan Mbeki, and Kathy Kathrada. And we thought we'll, we can escape, so Walter and I jumped out of here. But escape was impossible, much to the delight of one police sergeant, Durka. Oh, happy, he said, now we have you all. This is the end of your movement. And Sisulu said, not forever, we'll come back. Along with the conspirators, the police seized evidence and documents linking their already incarcerated leader to the plot. It was all there in the documents. Mandela notes on guerrilla warfare, Mandela summary of a book, How to Be a Good Communist. I felt, oh shit, it's come to an end. Too quick. As Mbeki said to us, uh, they've got Operation Mayabuya, this is high treason, chaps. Then we knew there was trouble. Probably won't survive this. Either killed trying to escape, in quotation marks, or would be executed, I was absolutely sure. We were taken to the fort, a very old prison in Johannesburg, and uh, each of us was uh, put in the, the death cells, uh, single cells, but for people who were sentenced to death. It's pitch black, and as we go into the prison, I'm looking out over the battlements, really just wanting to see the night sky for the last time. The conspirators had every reason to be fearful. They were now in the hands of a fully functional police state. To enforce government policy and to suppress subversion, police powers are immense and many illegal brutalities have been alleged. Anyone can be detained indefinitely without warrant or trial by repeated use of the 90-day detention law. And this was clearly a license for torture because you were not permitted access to family, friends or lawyers. The only visitors one gets are the police. And they come from time to time just with one message. Give me this bit of information or you're going to hang. Then they took us all the following morning, this was after two nights in custody, to Pretoria local prison. And that's where the real ordeal began. An encounter with an inmate on their first night gave the conspirators a taste of what they could expect. He already he had been tortured to the extent that he had lost his mind. So he kept us awake the whole night, making speeches, shouting slogans, singing, obviously out of his mind. And that's where I noticed the electric shock marks on his uh, fingers. Attempting to extract information from the conspirators was Captain Swanepoel, an expert torturer who had learned his craft from the French in Algeria. He would interrogate me with his pistol on the table, pointing at my midriff and playing with the trigger. And you didn't know if it was loaded or not and whether he was going to cut loose or not. One of his tactics with me was to pull out a revolver and put it on the table and you would be staring at this saying, what, what's he pulling out a revolver? And then after a while, he would spin it and say, here's one bullet. Do you want to take your chance on this or will it be the rope? 
I'm not going to talk about the period. It was enough that I came through it. I betrayed nobody as a result. The torturer's activities weren't confined to Pretoria. Across South Africa, they would go to any lengths in order to extract information from their captives. It was on the third floor at the Johannesburg station. They lifted me by my shoulders and pushed me head first out of the window. And they started asking me the questions again. I said, if you don't talk, we'll let go. I, I don't think anyone can actually imagine or describe the feeling that goes through your head and body. While the one chap is catching your ankle, pulling it back again, the other chap lets go. And they continued doing this for a while. And all you see is concrete at the bottom. No people, nothing. I think this is the way they dealt with Babla Saluji, who was uh, thrown off the sixth or seventh floor. Babla's body, when I saw the photograph, was lying flush. So they must have dropped him and he, he died that way. Look Smart and Goodley was a prominent ANC member and MK commander. Look Smart is arrested because he was where he said he wouldn't be, and he's tortured. They ripped out half his beard with the skin. Look Smart was such a handsome, intelligent, beautifully built man with a natural capacity for leadership. Man, we need people like that, and they murdered him. Miraculously, Dennis Goldberg managed to escape from jail. I escaped from prison at Ferenichung. I'm recaptured. My morale is terribly low, and they left me alone for three weeks. Had they interrogated me straight away, uh, I had cuts from climbing over roofs and things. Had they interrogated me, then I can't promise what would have happened. Family members of the conspirators were also rounded up. Among them, Anne-Marie Wolpe, whose husband Harold, a member of the MK High Command, had escaped custody. The police came right, right, right at seven in the morning. And I said, I'm busy with the baby. They said, fuck the baby, we don't care. You've got to come now. And they said, look at us, look at me when I ask you questions. I'd sit up and look at him. Then he'd yell, don't look at me like that, because I must have looked hate. Um, and they, he'd had his hands near my throat and shook the chair in which I was sitting. Uh, he was really very frightening. And I actually thought, I, I'm sorry for these men. They are so ill-educated and they are so, they d only know violence. They don't know how to express anger. The veins were sticking up here. Oh, they were enraged. Anne-Marie's brother was Jimmy Cantor, a playboy lawyer with no political involvement, who was arrested purely as an act of revenge for his brother-in-law's escape. Uh, we'd never met before, sitting side by side on toilets in the open air. He told me who he was, and he was about the side of whom else, depending on which loo you're sitting on. <laughs> and uh, he said, don't tell me anything you don't want the police to know. They had promised him, he said, release if he gave them information. And I thought this was immensely courageous. Courageous and showed integrity. And I have admired him ever since, I have to say. Having withstood torture, the detainees were eventually charged with conspiracy to overthrow the government by sabotage, a capital offence. The gallows seemed inevitable but the detainees were not the only ones prepared to defend the freedom of others, regardless of the cost to themselves. Joel Joffe, a 31-year-old Jewish lawyer, was disgusted by apartheid 
and was only hours away from emigrating to Australia with his wife and young family. They were leaving because they didn't want to live under apartheid. But when the need to defend people was there, in such a hostile environment, it felt a call of duty. You have to defend people. Hilda Bernstein, the wife of uh, Rusty Bernstein, accused number nine, eh, um, came to see me at my office and said that her husband, Rusty, had been arrested, was being held incarcerated in jail. Would I defend him? I said, yes, Hilda, I will do that, but I want to warn you that according to the media there's an, and the police, there is an incredibly strong case against all the accused and that they are likely uh, to be hanged. Public opinion is against the accused. And she turned to me and said, Mr Joffe, you and I talk different languages. Public opinion of the whites may be against the accused, but public opinion of the majority of blacks and of non-whites is very strongly in favour of the accused. And that was a lesson for me, <laughs> my first political lesson. He and his wife, Annetta, then needed to rent a flat and buy a mattress and sleep on the floor. As you can hear, I admire him very much, and his wife. They served us, they served many others. Unknown to Joel Joffe, his choice of QC to lead the defence team was taking a huge risk. Bram Fisher had attended many meetings at Lily's Leaf, and it was a pure stroke of luck that he was not there on the day of the police raid. Him and Nelson Mandela were actually people who brought together in one person all the attributes that one wished one had. Bram was a man of his word, a very honest person, soft-spoken, and when he says he'll do a thing, he'll do it. Total gentleman, total gentle man, highly intelligent. He was made of steel. I saw that come out on one or two occasions. Whether it was a child, or the man cleaning your shoes, or the Chief Justice, you, it was somebody who was owed respect. He was, he was a, a leader of the resistance movement. He was the natural choice. There was nobody comparable to him. You know, he was my hero and is my hero. Joining Bram Fischer and Joel Joffe would be veteran human rights advocate Vernon Beranger. He'd left South Africa and was living in Swaziland, I think, and he knew that if he took this case, it would be the end of his career because he would never be allowed back in South Africa. Vernon was a hunter. I mean, he shot animals, but he was also a hunter of men. He was the greatest criminal lawyer and the most effective and aggressive cross-examiner. And he loved to fight. In fact, he fought everybody. So he was a member of the Communist Party at one stage. He fought them and they expelled him. Completing this legal dream team were Arthur Chaskelson and George Bezos, who had been explicitly warned not to take the case. Rene Kruger, private counsel, came to my office and he was pacing up and down and talking about this or the other. And he eventually said, George, I have a message for you from the prime minister. And I'm reluctant to tell you, but on the other hand, if I did not tell you, I may not forgive myself. He told me that your rope was getting short. It was the greatest legal team ever assembled in a South African court, but the odds were stacked heavily against them and the defendants. Right from the start, we had to accept, because under the 90-day interrogation, they had already put it in our minds that you are going to hang. And our lawyers confirmed that. Prepare for the worst. On the 9th of October, 1963, huge crowds of supporters, among them Mandela's wife, Winnie, gathered at the Palace of Justice in Pretoria for the start of the trial. They brought us from local prison down Port Hitta Street. We were in a Quela Quela, a great big truck with seats and barred windows. They would have a cop 
at every crossing that have a lead car armed cops, a trail car armed cops, and we would just come flying in round here in that gate and the truck would stop here. It was exciting. Sirens wailing, roaring up to the prison. And then we'd sit and wait until they put a soldier with a submachine gun in his arm on every step. And when that was all done, and we surrounded here as well, then they would take us into the cells. They really thought in Punta Vesizwe were so capable of rescuing us. <laughs> but that's how it was. The streets were full of people, of course, in our supporters, and people are just curious to see why these people who have been arrested were appearing here. You see, but it's, it was encouraging to us to see that people like this are supporting us. So we go in. Yeah, I'll follow you, Andrew. I'll follow my leader. They need to keep us in a cell until time comes for us to go there. You were here? Yeah. The Ravonia trial. The water trial? Yeah. Do you remember the standard? Yeah. I don't know who wrote it up here. The Freedom, Freedom Charter, Charter, but it was there in 1963, 64, when we were on trial. South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. The people shall govern. All national groups shall have equal rights. The people shall share in the country's wealth. The land shall be shared among those who work it. All shall be equal before the law, and all shall enjoy equal human rights. It's very moving to be back here. It's my second time back in this cell, and it's just as moving as the first time I came back a few years ago, because it brings back such memories of solidarity, of friendship, of warmth, of Nelson Mandela calling me boy, and uh, what can I say? What can I say? Here we are. And Andrew's the oldest survivor, and then Kasrada and me. And when I turned 80, he sent me an email to say, congratulations on your 80th birthday, but you're still the baby of the Ravonia trial. <laughs> so yeah, here we are alive. It's great, you know. Yeah. <laughs> we were led up this steep staircase into the courtroom from the cells below. And Mandela's accused number one was the first, and I was number 11, the last. You remember we used to run up the steps, Andrew? Yeah, <laughs> not, not anyway. And I just heard the shouts, Mandela, Amanda Langueto, and, and the crowd responding. As they went up the stairs, each of them did that. Amandla! <laughs> yeah, this... What did they say? Uh, about what you say that? Aweto. Nguetu. Power is Amanda ours. That means power is ours. From day one, the accused refused to deny their role in the campaign of non-lethal sabotage. In so doing, they were effectively pleading guilty, seeking to turn this from a legal trial into a political one. It was essential to them that their conduct should be such as to inspire their followers to realize that <coughs> when it comes to fighting for justice and freedom, uh, your life is something which might need to be sacrificed. You go into the witness box, you proclaim your political belief, you don't apologize for them, for your activities, you don't ask for mercy, and if there's a death sentence, you don't appeal. Dennis made this offer to take the blame for everyone else because there's so much, so much evidence against him. I said, if you need me to take responsibility for exceeding my mandate and instructions, I will do that. And they just sort of looked at me as though I was crazy and ignored it. But it was a, a spur of the moment thing where you do what you feel you have to do because that leadership is so important. 
It wasn't out of a sense of, oh, I'm going to be a martyr or I'm going to sacrifice. It was just a bodyguard throws himself on top of the person he's protecting. Prisoners who have been sentenced to death were hanged every week at 6 a.m. in the morning. And at 6 p.m., everyone in the prison would start singing. And they would sing right through the night in solidarity with the people who were to be hanged. And so Mandela and all the accused were conscious all the time of the horror of what it was like to be hanged. And they carried on. And I said once to Govan, aren't you, aren't you frightened? And Govan said, well, you know, they put something around your neck, they press a button and you go down and you're dead. <laughs> What's that to be so frightened about? <laughs> this was this frail, frail gentleman. <laughs> So these were remarkable people. The defendant's uncompromising stance received an unexpected endorsement when Bram Fischer read that the eyes of the world were now on the Palace of Justice. He, almost at sunrise, turned up, brought a copy of uh, the Rand Daily Mail with a headline, UN calls for the release of Rivaldia accused. He said, I know you're going to see them this morning. Take them this and tell them that in my view that they're dead and hang them after this. I, all the way to Pretoria, I bought four or five copies of the Rand Daily Mail. I went to the consulting room. I put the newspaper in front of them with a headline. They were all overjoyed by it. And it was really the beginning of the worldwide campaign uh, about the release of Mandela and his co-accused. But the lead prosecutor in the trial, Dr. Percy Utah, had a very different agenda. They had told me they were going to get me hanged. They also told me that I would be hanged by one of your own people, they said. Who? The prosecutor. How's the prosecutor one of my people? Well, you're a Jew, and he's a Jew, and he's going to see you're hanged. Well, they were determined to hang me, and he was determined to hang us. It was easy for the defence to see that Yuta got so wrapped up in his desire to point out how pernicious these people were that he kept on forgetting things, important things. He didn't cross-examine Rusty. He was busy denigrating Rusty but he didn't cross-examine him about why he was at Ravonia. He was in such a rage that he suddenly sat down and he didn't ask any of the key questions <laughs> which we were all terrified he would ask. He could be very petty and very mean in his... Not a mean in with Not only to the witnesses, but in relation to the defence lawyers. Mm. And you can't really run a case unless there's at least some cooperation between uh, prosecution and, and defence. And he said something or other uh, that was offensive. And Verum Berenger said, Oh, Percy, you're such a little person. Y Utah was very angry about this and he wouldn't speak to the defence at all. What witness is coming next? How do we prepare the cross-examination, etc.? Until George Bezos said, Leave it to him, he would fix it up. So he came back later, he said, OK, guys, it's all fixed up. And we said, what did you do? He said, Percy, you know, I know Vernon insulted you. He called you a little fellow. But he didn't mean you were small, small. He just meant you were small-minded. <laughs> oh, says Utah, is that all it was? Then that's OK. <laughs> all he wanted was somebody to say sorry. Didn't, he didn't listen to the words. <laughs> but that was George as well. Bram Fischer was quick to exploit these failings. He eviscerated Utah's indictment and first blood went to the defence. When it was clear that the judge was going to throw out the indictment, Utah stands up and says, my lord, I, I, I think it is important that at this stage I should give you, give the court the benefit of my opening speech. And in it, of course, in an opening address, you can say anything you like. So it was these traitors seeking to destroy 
good the, the, uh, South Africa and uh, in that in that particular town. And he said, "I want to hand it in to my your lordship before you make ju uh, pass judgment." And even the judge was totally astonished. He said, "Mr. Utah, this is a court of law." not a political meeting, but I mean, this is unheard of uh, behavior by a prosecuting counsel. The, the indictment had been quashed. Technically, we were free. So I kissed my wife. And uh, this big fat detective, Dirke, came along and he gave me a push with his hand to push me down these steep steps. And I jerked back with my elbow in his gut. Oh, it was lovely. It sank in about six feet. <laughs> I assaulted a cop. <laughs> Humiliated by Fisher, Utah sought to preempt critical newspaper headlines by trying to turn one of the accused. He summoned Bob Heppel and handed him an ultimatum. Give evidence against your comrades and be released, or face the rope. I had a, a conversation with Brom Fisher and later with Nelson Mandela about what I should do. And Brom Fisher, his approach was, uh, you must take a personal decision on this. Later, I had a meeting in a consultation room with Nelson Mandela, and I told him the story, and he uh, said to me that um, there were dangers. But I said, if I can get him to release me conditionally uh, and then escape, what would you say? He said, that would be excellent. He said to me, you will not be judged by the past, but by how you will be, uh, how you behave in the future. Heppel agreed to Utah's demands and was released on bail. But within days, with the assistance of Bram Fisher, he had escaped to England, where he was to become a distinguished academic lawyer, pioneering equality legislation. Well, my attitude is that whatever Bob Heppel did is so long in the past, and I know that many people can be broken and were broken under torture. He did not, in the end, give the evidence in court. For whatever reasons he didn't give it, he left. The fact is, he was there, he was doing things for the liberation of the people of South Africa. And to that extent, he's a hero. Mm. There were lots of people who came out of prison who'd been broken, who were taken back into the leadership of the ANC. So why not Bob? Percy Utah's amended indictment was little better than his first effort. But the judge, by now impatient to get on, rejected the defendant's challenge to it. It was planned by the accused to set up a provisional revolutionary government to take over the administration and control of this country. When the indictment was read to Nelson Mandela and the clerk of the Registrar of the Court, said at the commencement of the trial. Uh, accused number one, do you plead guilty or not guilty? And Mandela's response was, I plead not guilty. It is the government which should be on trial and not me. He was still in prison clothes and leg irons and handcuffs. And it's against regulations to present a prisoner to a judge in humiliating dress. Uh, Walter Sisulu stood up, said the government should be on trial, not me. And the judge said, we don't want political speeches over here. And Sassoula very calmly said, it is the government which should be on trial, not me. And all the other accused followed suit. And that was Nelson, that, that toughness and yet humanness as well, to wear handcuffs and leg irons and be dignified in short pants. For a grown African man in short pants, nothing more humiliating. Only little boys wear short pants, you know, and, uh, but he could make even coarse prison clothes look elegant. Utah then produced a mountain of evidence seized during the Rivonia raid, linking the accused to the MK sabotage campaign. They did not deny any of it. A key to their whole defense was, we accept responsibility for everything we have done and that was a, effectively an admission of, the, of guilt, but that was not, not important to them. Their lives were of secondary importance. I wasn't ever going to 
allow them to intimidate me. And I could have been cold and dignified, but that's not me. So the question was, two fingers or one? They got one finger, economical way. However, the legal team did not share the defendant's seeming indifference to the gallows. We as lawyers were very happy, well, in my case, very happy that, about the political objective, but was, a, was obsessed with the thought of these extraordinary human beings uh, of such outstanding integrity and courage and commitment that they should actually be hanged. It was Bram Fisher who identified a potential lifeline, that although the defendants had discussed a blueprint for guerrilla warfare, they hadn't adopted it. Here the evidence will show that while preparations for guerrilla warfare were being made from as early as 1962, no plan was ever adopted, and the evidence will show why it was hoped throughout that such a step could be avoided. The defence case will commence with a statement from the doc by accused number one, who personally took part in the establishment of Umkanto and who will be able to inform the court of the beginnings of that organisation. Accused number one was Nelson Mandela. It was thought by Nelson that he should make a statement from the dock. Written in his own hand, page after page after page, and then the lawyers went through it for dangerous admissions, or that weren't necessary. But it was his speech. There was no question. By choosing not to speak from the witness box, Mandela was putting his cause above his own life. He could now deliver a damning indictment of apartheid to his supporters without interruption. But because his statement would carry less weight in law, the risk of being hanged was increased. Percy Utah, who had banked on his cross-examination of Mandela being a passport to becoming the first Jewish Attorney General, was taken completely by surprise. Utah leaped up and he said, my lord, my lord, in a very falsetto voice, please instruct the accused that it will bear, rule against him if he uh, does not go into the witness box. And Cortes de Vet, the judge, said very dryly, Dr. Utah, I think the uh, counsel for the defense are well aware of the criminal code. And Utah sat down, squashed. Mandela's speech was to last several hours and ended with perhaps the most famous and influential rallying cry in legal history. I have fought against white domination and I have fought against black domination. I have cherished the idea of a democratic, and free society. It is an idea for which I hope to live and to see realized. But my Lord, if it needs be, it is an idea for which I am prepared to die. When he finished and sat down, there was a long silence in the court, seemed to stretch on and on. And then in the audience, there was a kind of collective sigh uh, because of the clear challenge to the judge, hang me if you dare, and to the whole of white South Africa, I think. And then I realized, even though we'd all seen the speech and made comments, he was saying, Judge, hang me, hang Walter, hang Dennis, hang Govan, hang all the way down the line. And I felt such tremendous pride at sharing this moment with him. You know, there was that feeling which is indescribable, I can't describe it. He felt proud. We all associated ourselves with the statement that Madiba made. And especially when he said the last words that uh, 
if need be, I'm prepared to die. You know, you don't choose to be on trial for your life, but if you are, to be with a person mm -hmm. who so clearly expresses all our views. Uh, freedom is important, we're prepared to die for it. I witnessed grace under fire. It was so delivered with elegance, that's what I'm trying to say. And I think in the end it changed history. At least one defendant had to be exposed to cross-examination if the judge was to accept that Operation Mayabuye had not been adopted. Walter Sisulu had had only four years in primary school. Utah had a PhD in law. Over six days, Sisulu wiped the floor with him. Walter gave the court a lecture on the history of the African National Congress. In the cross-examination, Utah said to Walter Sisulu, you say things are very bad here, then why do so many blacks come from, so many Bantu come from all over Africa to work here? And he said to Utah very hostilely, very angrily, I wish, Mr. Utah, you could live just one day of your life like we have to live, and you wouldn't make such statements about things are good here for us. Oh, what a powerful moment. Do you remember it, Andrew? Oh, man, oh, man. Not only Nelson Mandela, but all the accused impressed me by their dignity. There was a, a common dignity amongst them that never wavered. This was a vindication of George Bezos's advice. The more they exposed the judge to the defendant's human qualities, the harder he would find it to sentence them to death. Well, just watching them and seeing these very dignified men who had such a constructive sense of what should happen, who were not greedy, who were not jumping on a bandwagon, who really wanted to have a South Africa that was for everybody. On the 11th of June, 1964, eight months after their trial had begun, the defendants arrived at court to hear Justice Quartus de Vett announce his verdict. The verdict will be Accused number one is found guilty on all four counts. Accused number two is found guilty on all four counts. Accused number three is found guilty on all four counts. It came as no surprise when the judge found all the defendants guilty, with the exception of Rusty Bernstein. I think the judge simply wasn't going to heed the legalities and niceties. He was going to acquit one person and that was Rusty. And so the rest of us had to be found guilty. Bernstein was promptly rearrested on other charges. But Vernon Beranger, through clever footwork, secured his release on bail and he fled to exile in England. The others returned to their cells to await sentencing the following day. I slept very well. I wasn't anxious. Casrada, on some occasions, said, we knew we were going to be sentenced to death and we'd had months to get used to it. It was just a case of, let's hear it and let's get on with it. That night, Mandela jotted down what he would say if sentence of death was passed. It ended, if I must die, let me declare for all to know that I will meet my fate like a man. So we really expected death sentences. And when you look at the gallows together, there's a bond can never be broken, only by death. It's stronger than marriage, I'm afraid. On the 12th of June, 1964, the defendants learned if standing up to be counted had cost them their lives. We weren't sure, really, and our lawyers weren't sure, and Joe particularly wanted us to be prepared for the worst. And so we came in, it was very quiet and very still, uh, there was anxiety. Certainly, I felt anxiety. The crime of which the accused have been convicted, that is the main crime, the crime of conspiracy, is in essence one of high treason. The state has decided not to charge the crime in this form. The moment the 
judge said that because the conspiracy had not been charged as high treason, but under the Sabotage Act, that but, oh, what a relief. All of us, there was a little twitch. Bearing this in mind and giving the matter very serious consideration, I have decided not to impose the supreme penalty, which in a case like this would usually be the proper penalty for the crime. But consistent with my duty, that is the only leniency which I can show. The sentence in the case of all the accused will be one of life imprisonment. People are saying, what did you say? What did you say? It was not very clear. My mother, who was in court, called out, Dennis, Dennis, what is it? And I said, it's life, and life is wonderful. We laughed, first gently, but then we embraced and hugged, because life, I have to tell you, is wonderful. At the back entrance to the Pretoria court, large crowds gather to watch the accused being driven away to start their life sentences. There was a huge crowd all around, and the truck pulled out through the crowd of people holding posters, you will never serve your sentence, uh, and chanting and singing, and some of the guys are putting their fists through the window with the ANC thumbs up sign and shouting back. It was exciting. I am slightly relieved. It could have been far worse than this. In fact, my people and I expected death sentences for all the accused. I shall never lose hope, and my people shall never lose hope. In fact, we expect that the work will go on. By saving the defendants from what had seemed certain death, the legal team changed history. The scale of their achievement was summed up in a letter by advocate George Bezos to Bram Fischer. As success is measured at the bar, our team cannot be said to have done very well, Eight life sentences and one acquittal are usually nothing to brag about. But I will always say with pride that I was one of Bram Fischer's juniors in that case where defeat was turned into victory by Bram Fischer. But even as the Rivonia defendants were being spared, the grisly apparatus of apartheid was claiming other victims. We were waiting all morning for the result and we were very worried because they could so easily have gotten the death sentence. And um, while I was sitting there waiting, there were two women, two African women came into my office. The phone rang and it was um, someone to tell me that they had gotten life sentences. So we were just thrilled about that. And I was very excited and happy. And um, these were, I told these women <clears throat> and they were very happy to hear it too. And they lit up. But then I asked them, well, what, what is it you want? Why are you here? Because they might have been here about a defense for one of their husbands or so on. They said, no, our, our, our husbands were hanged this morning in Pretoria. And we wanted to, to know how we can get their bodies. After we were sentenced and taken back to the prison, I said to then Colonel Ocump, who was the head of prison security, you look so happy, you look like the cat that looked, licked the cream. He turned on me with real anger and said, you should have been hanged. Yeah. And you will never get out of here, you'll never walk out of here on your own two feet. We'll carry you out feet first in a coffin. No, but you are so provocative, how can you say that to him? It's provocation. Well, of course, what more can they do to me? I'm in prison for life, you what can they do? You are a cheeky man, very cheeky bastard. <laughs> Having escaped the noose, the defendants now had to decide whether or not to appeal their life sentences. They were unanimous. They said, we will not appeal. And even those who actually could have been acquitted on appeal stood by it. Kath Rada served an extra 25 years when actually, <laughs> or 27 years <laughs> imprisonment because of solidarity. It was a political decision. In my case, it was more important because I'm an Indian. I've been speaking at meetings, Safari Town, Alexander Township, all over before my ban. And these were all black areas predominantly. What would they say if I now break ranks and appeal? 
The day after the trial, in an effort to persuade the convicted men to reconsider an appeal, Bram Fisher set off for Cape Town, accompanied by his wife Molly and their friend Liz Franklin. We were driving along and it was now dark. And suddenly Bram said, there's a cow on the road. At that moment, a motorbike came the other way and the cow got a fright and leapt back into our path. And Bram swerved, but we went over the road, off the road and into a river. Bram opened, couldn't get out of the door and he opened his window and started to climb out of it. And I just automatically followed, copied him and did the same on my side. And the car just disappeared. And they, they had to fish Brom out of the water because he didn't, he didn't want to get out. He was still looking and diving and trying to find Molly. He dived right off the bridge to see if he could dive deep enough, but he couldn't. Brom never forgave himself for, for the accident. Um, it really yeah, it shattered him completely. Just a week after the accident, following Molly's funeral, Fisher was on Robin Island visiting Cathrada and the others. Brahm and, and, and uh, Joel came to see us. Uh, naturally, the first question we asked is, how's Molly? And uh, he said, no, she's all right. He didn't want to add to the suffering of the accused by letting him know that Molly had died. And it was a measure of the man here, heartbroken, that he didn't want to add it to his friend and colleague's uh, uh, suffering. Brown did come to see me with Joel Joffe, our instructing attorney. And he was in such a state. I thought he needed to cry. I would have loved him to have cried. Would have been great for him but he sort of blinked away the half tears as they formed. Still reeling from Molly's death, Bram Fischer was dealt another blow when he was arrested for being a member of the Communist Party, once again paying the price for his convictions. His communism, it's about self-sacrifice in the interests of the poor, about not shrinking away from doing what you believe to be as right, whatever the cause to yourself and indeed to your family. Before his trial, Fisher was unexpectedly granted bail to argue a legal case in the Privy Council in London. He promised to return, telling the court, I am an Afrikaner. My home is in South Africa. I will not leave South Africa because my political beliefs conflict with those of the government. He saw a lot of the, the exiled comrades there and he, they put a lot of pressure on him to stay. Um, but this is where Brahms' real Afrikaner, real South African commitment came to the fore. And he just said, there is no way. He'd always said, he'd always been most regretful when other people left the country. He was a man of his word. He said he would come back for the trial and he did. Fisher returned as promised, but two months into his trial, decided that a dramatic gesture was needed to show that at least one prominent Afrikaner was prepared to defy a fundamentally evil regime. When Brahm started to clear out his library, I assumed it was because he was anticipating a jail sentence. And we all thought that it would be for membership of the party and probably be the sort of three to five year uh, operation. But Fisher was actually planning to make a supremely selfless gesture. He jumped bail and went underground, knowing full well that when he was inevitably caught, the regime would throw the book at him. And his son, Paul, who suffered from a degenerative disease, would be left with no parent to look after him. I think he saw himself as attempting to show that not all Afrikaners were dyed-in-the-wool racists. In a letter to the court, Brahm wrote, I can no longer serve justice in the way I have attempted to do for the last 30 years. If the court does have to punish any of my fellow accused, 
it will be punishing them for holding the ideas today that will be universally accepted tomorrow. Brahm took the view that one prominent Afrikaner, at least, must stand up and say, not in my name, not in the name of this Afrikaner. Shortly before Brahm went underground, Joel Joffe and his wife Vanetta finally reinstated their long-delayed departure from South Africa. And I only finally left South Africa when everybody had been locked up. Brahm walked up to Joel at the gate. I think he hugged me and we said goodbye. And Brahm came back and he was weeping. He was very upset. And yet he, he was very fond of me. <laughs> he just felt he relied on him such a lot. <laughs> When it almost moves me to tears to think that he did. Joel and Brahm had a, an enormously loving relationship, to use as best any word I can think of. I think they both loved each other. They had huge respect for each other. Brahm often said that Joel was the closest person to Jesus Christ that he'd ever met, which was a nice thing for a nice Jewish man like Joel. Fisher's decision to jump bail did not go down well with his colleagues on the Bar Council. Two days later, to his utter dismay, they moved to have him disbarred for dishonourable conduct. In his mind, there was no dishonour in following his political conscience. Brown was very, very upset about being struck off. They called him dishonourable. It was the thought that his, his colleagues could think that of him. Uh, he didn't expect them to understand his political ideas, perhaps, or, or sympathise with them. But to call him a man without honour was really not acceptable for him. Now wanted for conspiracy to overthrow the government, a capital offence, Fisher became front page news as the Red Pimpernel, adopting a disguise, evading the authorities and taunting them through the press. We were not surprised that uh, Brahms Brahms gone underground. No, it, it boosted our morale. Fisher's alter ego, Mr. Black, was nothing if not convincing. I didn't recognise him when I first saw him. You thought he was special branch? I thought he was a policeman. I thought I'd been led into a trap until he opened his mouth and those gentle, drawling voice came out and I recognised it. Bromet had a very thick head of white hair. So he shaved up to, you know, to make it bald, and the rest was dyed dark, and he'd grown a little beard. I mean, he just looked totally different. And to disguise his limp, because he had bad knee rugby injury from years and years before, he minced. There's no other word for his, he minced. That was his walk. <laughs> Despite Fisher's growing renown, those found guilty of sharing his communist sympathies could expect no mercy. I went to prison uh, when I was 21. I was forced into exile. The woman that I deeply loved, we were forced apart. And I expected to live the rest of my life out in exile. Fisher's luck finally ran out when the police arrested veteran Communist Party member Violet Weinberg. Violet was subjected to the statue torture. Old woman, varicose veins. She held out for 24 hours. When Violet Weinberg was arrested, I phoned him, you know, we used to go to a call box and phoned him and I said, it's okay, now it's time you must go. And I think Violet holding out for 24 hours, given her conditions, is one of the bravest things I know. They found a key in her bag, which she couldn't explain. And eventually they broke her down to the point where she had to explain where this key came from. And that led to Brahms' hideout. After 290 days underground, Fisher was arrested and put on trial for his life 
in the same court where a year earlier he had defended Mandela and his comrades. I asked him, Brown, for nine and a half months, involvement in the, the underground, was it worthwhile for you to give up your family, to give up your practice and go underground? And he became angry with me. And he asked me, did you ask Nelson the same questions that you are putting to me? I said, no. If he did not ask him, didn't he have a practice? Didn't he have a family? Why did you not ask him? And why do you ask me? I had no answer. But he was a forgiving one. He showed his anger, but that didn't prevent us from remaining friends. But it was a lesson for me. Like Mandela, Fisher would make his statement from the same dock. And like Mandela's, his speech would pave the way for the eventual reconciliation between the black population and the Afrikaners. You don't remember his speech in the same detail, but when I read the speech later, it's as remarkable a speech as Nelson Mandela's is, with this commitment to a higher law than the law of the land, uh, and a clear willingness to die for freedom for all. If one day my conduct may help to establish a bridge across which white leaders and the real leaders of the non-whites can meet to settle the destinies of all by negotiation and not by force, I shall be able to bear with fortitude any sentence which this court may impose on me. Fisher escaped the gallows, but was sentenced to a whole life term. He joined Dennis Goldberg in a whites-only prison in Pretoria probably the only example in history of a QC serving a life sentence for the same offence and in the same cell block as his client. But they were far from their comrades on Robin Island. We applied to go to Robin Island because we felt we should show solidarity. And we were very few and we needed the strength of numbers. But of course we were informed that our policy, Goldberg, is apartheid, you know that, and we will not allow you to be together. That was it. On Robin Island, Mandela and the others were attempting to draw a line in the sand with their jailers. So we had taken a stand that we will not adhere to any quota. We will not allow any vulgarity on their part. We will not uh, allow them to address us in these derogatory term terms. Uh, and we won't allowed them to humiliate us in any way. They had never worked as political prisoners. So it took us some time before they learned that the political prisoners were different. In Pretoria prison, Fisher continued to exude the selfless qualities that had contributed to him being there. Brown never stopped being political. Brown never stopped cheering us. Brown never stopped looking for answers to how we achieve our freedom how we incorporate the Afrikaans-speaking people, his people, into the new South Africa. Brahm would always be there for everybody else, even in prison. And the prison, head of the prison, an Afrikaner nationalist, loved Brahm and hated him because he was a traitor to the Afrikaners. But he was brilliant, and he was prepared to give more individual legal advice, best they could ever get. And yet he was this enemy who wanted to see the blacks in charge. Um, and so they gave him hell, but they also reveled in his presence and they could be superior to him. He had this warder who was in charge of him who, was, who would make him do the most uh, humiliating things that he possibly could, like cleaning the toilets on his hands and knees and so on. Four years into his sentence, Fisher received news of his son Paul's death. His brother came to see him, was given a special visit, told Brahm that his son Paul had died. Brahm was taken back to his cell and locked up for the night. It was very awful, I think. That, um, and then he was just put in a cell on his own. We didn't hear about it till the morning. Um, and all you can do in prison is be there for a comrade. Now, when Paul died, there was a lot of 
um, pressure put on, on the authorities to let Brahm come to the funeral. But of course they, they wouldn't. Eight years into his life sentence, the increasingly frail Fisher suffered a fall. Stepped into the shower, slipped, banged his thigh on the step. It was in dreadful pain. We made him a crutch out of a broomstick until eventually the authorities gave him a proper crutch. Uh, but in fact, he'd broken his leg and nobody would look at it. They had to fight to get him medical attention. When they found it was cracked, they whipped him off to hospital only to discover that he had cancer. And they couldn't tell which cancer it was because his medical notes had disappeared. First of all, they didn't treat him for a long time. I mean, he was in tremendous pain. Later, we used just an ordinary dining room chair, much lighter than a wheelchair, so we could carry him up and down and he could be with us. Eventually, he was taken away for proper treatment. In April 1975, terminally ill, Fisher was transferred, still under prison supervision, to his brother's home in Bloemfontein, where he died a few weeks later. The authorities confiscated his ashes, no doubt to avoid his grave becoming a shrine for opponents of the regime. They have never been recovered. I think he was interested in what it was that gave people the strength to suffer uh, in a cause for, for which they believed to be right. You know that Nelson Mandela could be c categorized as an Africanist in the late 40s. What turned him around, and what turned Mandela around, were the contributions that white people were prepared to make, that were prepared to go to prison together with black Africans. And that changed him to a, a non-racial being, which he showed over and over again. On Robin Island, Nelson Mandela presided over a memorial service for his fallen comrade and sent a telegram to Fisher's elder daughter, Ruth. Deepest sympathy from Robin Island. Farewell, people's hero. His spirit will live forever. Our salute, great son of Africa, Mandela. Nelson Mandela later said that Bram Fisher was a free man who fought against his own people to ensure the freedom of others. As an Afrikaner whose conscience forced him to reject his own heritage, he showed a level of courage and sacrifice that was in a class of its own. How many years did you serve in prison, Dennis? 22 years. Andrew, how many years did you serve in prison? 26 and four months. And was it worth it? Yeah, oh yes, oh yes, very much worth it. Definitely worth it. Quite definitely it was worth it, yes. That's all I ever wanted. I would say, yeah, it's been worth it. What happened in 1994 should have come earlier. Should have been earlier. Those 20 years were wasted, but we don't regret it. Not at all. We've made our country free, and uh, uh, so many people are enjoying the fruits, yeah. and there's still so much more to do. Absolutely. And in prison, our hopes were high. We said a luta continua, and we still say it with equal determination. Yeah. We're all involved in social projects and political activity. It just goes on and on because we need to go on and on, and we're just pleased to be where we are. Oh, I feel uh, great, man. It's, it's a great day. It's now, especially at the meeting, Tommy Dennis is here uh, in this in famous institution. We made it famous, yeah. We made it famous. <laughs> a little bit. You put it on the map. <laughs> oh, yes, on the world map. Yes. I love this time of the day in Pretoria. It's oh, cool. It's this. cool. Look uh, at the sky. It's not hot. It's normally very hot. Though. Look at this guy, just look how beautiful.
the generation of today, uh, Nick, don't know how much we suffered. During our arrest and in prison, and to see what is happening today in the country, it makes one's heart to bleed, really. My, my heart bleeds, Dennis. You know that our people are so tolerant of what happened, are able to let bygones be bygones. I think it's an astonishing act of generosity because the wounds are so deep in the perpetrators, in the, those who have suffered and their families. And yet somehow, somehow we've managed to hold it together. The mind and the soul have been freed to fulfill themselves. Never, never, never again. and never again shall it be that this beautiful love will again experience the oppression of one by another. God bless Africa. I thank you. He had the ability to find the right words and to dramatize it, didn't he, Andrew? Yes, yes. What a wonderful day. I was there. So when I say I'm proud to be here and come back here and rejoice in what we've achieved, that's why. Because of that speech, because of the people, because of what we've done.